if you were in Charlotte and you were in Atlanta and I was in Tennessee and you were down in Savannah and we all said, let's meet at this building and you pull up Waze app, Waze is going to give you three, four options each to get to the same location that we're going to. It's almost like the way our maps are in our own heads. The only difference is we don't get all those options in real time and there's not a bunch of satellites helping us. And so it is important, though, when we understand another person's journey. See, that's the whole way a GPS works is you say where you want to be, and then it tells you, it looks at where you are, and it helps you get there. But see, what we're doing is we're, we're in different locations in our worlds and our own mental maps, even subconscious maps that we have already, that have happened to us. We're living in a current world, and we keep importing the past to try to make a future. And it gets too heavy. And what we need to do is talk to each other on that journey using the Waze app as we're going to the same place. Because me coming from Tennessee, you saying, Tim, why are you dragging? Well, I'm coming through the mountains. It ain't, it, I don't have a problem coming up, right? You're, you two are hitting, you know, 85, coming, he, you know, he's hitting up from the beach, feeling good, right, from Savannah, right? I'm coming through the mountains and hoping there's not a landslide, right? Because I'm going to get all you guys to buy me a new car. <laughs> but that's what happens when we're trying to project our journey on other people. Instead of getting a better understanding that my Waze app and your Waze app is different. You saw the daily bread. Here's the new recipe. You can't expect to see more transparency. 5,006 figure earners. This success to me. Giving the best of me. My living legacy. What's going on guys? Welcome back to another episode of The Modern Man. This is a show where we like to tackle, discuss, and really explore the different challenges and obstacles that men go through in today's society. On the panel, the usual suspects, as you always see, Tyler Harris, Charles Russ in the building, and our special guest for today, Tim Pecoraro. What's going on, man? Hey, man. T-Pack. T-Pack. Yeah. <laughs> hey. I'm here. I'm here. We're going to have some fun with today's topic, and this is actually a really exciting topic to discuss about in terms of raising standards, not just for ourselves, but for men. And before we kind of jump into the, the nuts and bolts of this, Tim, why don't you introduce yourself and kind of let our viewers know who you are and what it is you do. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me on. And uh, I'm just, uh, I'm a people person, man. I'm a leader, a communicator, and an artist. Nice. And, it's in, and my, my passion is people. Yeah. And I believe in helping people, what I call the uphill life, live the uphill life. Anything worth having is uphill, but you can't go uphill with a downhill habit. <laughs> and so I want to help people be more, do more, and have more. And there are reasons for being, doing, and having for them to figure out nobody else. And so I spend my day, every day, helping people unlock that. I like themselves. it. I like it, man. Well, we're excited to have you on. And I guess we'll jump right into it in terms of standards and raising your standards. Before we talk about raising our standards, where do we set the base of our standards? Where do we think the base of standards should be in, in the current form? TPAC. Wow, you know, that's a great question. Um, because I know, you know, it's gonna be relative to your own experiences, number one. I mean, everything begins with, you know, these, that domestication that you come up with in your own family, where you came from. Um, those things that you are a product of, the environment that you've been in. And so, unfortunately, we have a disadvantage of trying to create a standard, especially when we're not sure, because it's elusive. Um, we, because we get very selective and it's all situational. They're situational standards. And, um, you know, because so many people, and I'm just gonna make this comment because they tie together, but so many people will, they'll violate their own values, right, to satisfy a need. And to me, living the, you have a belief which is a foundation and you have a value to me which is the vision part, right? Because all of us believe something, right? We all believe something. In our beliefs, we could share them, but then they start getting differences and our opinions take place, right? But when it comes to our value part, the value is where we can start really sharing because we may come from totally different walks of life, but if we can come together on value, we can start working together, right? But if I have a low standard, my values will come down. They are going to drop. And then what's going to happen is going to put me on shaky ground at my belief level, which will cause me as a human being with a need. So let's just say I need certainty as a need just love as a need or connection as a need, I'll violate my own values to meet that need. 
And that's where it seems like it's an elusive thing. That's why you've got to be clear, I think, at a base level to start with the simple thing. What matters most to you? What is the thing that will not only just benefit you, but other people? And it's at a simple level. For me, like an example of a value is just being intentional about everything I do. In other words, I do it on purpose. And I want to be able to make it at least at that level. I want to start there because then I can express beyond myself and see value come from me and out into the world. Yeah. Now to start in terms of seeing those standards and those values, some people might not know what their standards are. Yeah. They might not necessarily have a vision or a value because they haven't taken the time to either reflect with themselves or with their environments to find out exactly what it is their standard is or what their, their values and beliefs are. How can somebody go about exploring that in themselves? I mean, the, the topic of today is how we raise them. Yeah. And so I think your standard is just where you are right now. It's just taking an honest look at where you are because there's a big difference between where you say you are and where you are. And so taking an honest look at where am I right now with my business, with my relationships, with my body, with my mind, and understanding that that now becomes the floor. And when we talk about raising it, it's, it's now to looking at how can we take it to the next level and raise those standards. And I think this will be a reoccurring theme for me because it's something I've just been listening and reading a lot about lately in regards to this conversation. But if we think of standard as the thermostat, of our life, see the, the thermostat is, is, is where we're currently at and where we're comfortable and where we're sometimes complacent. And when we all of a sudden have periods of time where, where things heat up, where things get better, we'll somehow figure a way to get things back down to where our thermostat is set, to where our standard is. The same is also true if all of a sudden we go through a period of time where things aren't going so great, we'll figure out a way to get them back up to where our thermostat is set in that standard. And what I'm excited about is later on in the episode, really getting into how do we raise that standard, which is how do we raise our own internal thermostat. Um, but the standard should just be where am I today and being very objective about it. You are where you are and no matter where that is, good, bad, or indifferent, that's the standard now. And let's get on to, to how do we get, get that thing moving up? <laughs> yeah. hmm. uh, I would offer like a little, maybe a slight word manipulation. Um, from my own experiences, my own trials or whatever, there are times I've been below what I would consider my standard. Um, and, you know, and I love to tell myself, and I guess that that's also part of the episode is raising the standard. Like, I'm never dropping below this. You know, that's when I think standard. I'm like, that's basic bottom line. I'm not getting worse. If I do a true self-evaluation and then I look at that evaluation and assess it, I may not be at my standard. I mean, like, no, this is bad. This can't be my standard. It has to, it has to raise. Now, as far as setting that standard, you know, I, I love what you said. I mean, he went straight into the deep water like... Oh man, you know, I'm, I'm a analytic action plan, boom, boom, boom type guy. And the fact that you explain that is awesome uh, already. So you've already got, no, I'm giving you a clear one, two, three, four, five, six, how we're going to get this thing done. That's, that's my type of, of conversation, my type of thought process. Uh, but establishing what your standard is, there's way too many variables. I think for me to give you a cookie cutter method, it's long conversations, it's some thought, and it, it should be something that you really think through. It shouldn't be something that you can do in five minutes or probably not even in a day. You know, your standard, your standard, and if we're talking about as a man, that should encompass everything you do, your fitness, your mental, your, your, your work, your family, relationships. All that stuff laid out is this is my standard for my life. Um, so to establish that, it'll depend on a lot of things. It depends on, okay, how much do you value your physical fitness? Where do you see it at? You know, what do you want from it? I just want to be able to get off the couch and be basically functional versus yeah. I want to be a, a savage. Yeah. Neither one of them's wrong. I think I know kind of where we, what we would all say, but neither one of them's technically wrong. That guy just said, look, man, I do, I do 30 minutes Pilates and I walk three miles twice a week. That might be his standard and he may be okay with that. So establishing your standard, the key word is actually your. It's yours. It's what are you? What is going to allow you to to have fulfillment at the lowest level? That's 
and, and identifying that in several categories, however you break your life down, identifying that in each category, laying it down, writing it down, letting yourself know that this is, this is it is kind of the, the base, I feel like, for setting that standard. I really like that at the lowest level. Because, I mean, really, when you think about it, you're at your lowest level when you don't know. Mm -hmm. And you're just kind of doing things. I mean, you're just doing life, right? And, and what Tyler said about just the, that really sitting down and asking those questions, you know, not why am I doing this, why am I behaving this, but it's more of what, you know, it's a what question, you know. If there's purpose underneath the what, if that's where your why is. But I really like the introspection component with that is introspection gives you the insight that you ultimately are going to need in order to progress. But I really like that, like figure it out, you know, because one of our needs, again, it's, it's that variety and variety looks different for all of us to be able to have some opportunity. For me, I like chaos. I really do. And the reason I like chaos is because for me, I like constellation as well. I like putting cosmos into chaos. But it took me a long time to figure that out. <laughs> and trust me, I got burned more by chaos than as I'm trying to put some constellation to it, it would end up be a very detrimental, it was a very detrimental thing to me because I obviously didn't have the maturity, emotional intelligence was lacking. But I didn't start there. It was like, I jumped over. I didn't want to at least, I didn't want the foundation. I tried to jump all in. And I think that's dangerous for men yeah. because sometimes our ego can really be driving us sometimes where we either shut completely down or we try to prove it or push too far beyond it, you know, instead of just saying, establish your baseline. What is that baseline? What's it look like by asking real questions? So we all establish our baseline. We find out what our standard is. And like you mentioned before, kind of living with intent, right? I think that's when we get to the point of finding our standard and getting to the section now of raising that, living with intent. What are the actions we take on a daily basis or we can take on a daily basis to go from where our, our lowest point, our standards are set to actually start lifting that bad boy up? The number one way I know to raise your standard is to raise the standards of the people that are around you, meaning change the people that are around you. When you start hanging around people that are living their life at a much higher standard, you're, it is impossible to stay the same. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that's, that's always been the case. And, and I've seen it play out in so many people's lives that, again, when you think about that thermostat, when I start hanging around with people that are at a higher temperature, it is going to naturally make my temperature higher. It is going to naturally bring my thermostat up. Um, so that to me is, is the first step because that's one that really doesn't take a huge amount of, of effort, a huge amount of change just by adding certain people into your, your circle of influence uh, that you can be inspired by. Can I ask you, is that something you think should be done gradually or quickly? Because for example, I had a fish tank with African cichlids and when you put them in the water, they say, you put them in the, in the water with their bag with the natural water first, and then you slowly take it out because they have to slowly acclimate to the temperature. Or if they switch too fast, if the temperature changes too fast, they can die. Do you think if someone were to go from where they are and go in over their heads, as we mentioned, going all in at once, do you think that could be dangerous or should they kind of up that thermostat slowly? I don't know if there can be danger in adding people too quickly. I think there can be danger in letting people go too quickly, um, just relationally. Mm -hmm. I know that's something that I've done a bad job of, of just completely alienate, alienating myself from groups of friends that I had and, and burned a lot of bridges and with those relationships that I wish looking back that I didn't. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know if you can add people too quickly though. I, I don't know if, I don't know if that, I can't, off the top of my head, think of a scenario where all of a sudden having a, a bunch of new people enter my life that are all at living at a higher standard was necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I would be careful because you're talking about human beings. You have to be very careful. You know, there's so much stuff out there on social media now with Gary Vee and people that are just like, cut everybody out of your life that's negative, even if it's your mom and your sister. Like, these are human beings. Like you, you got to be careful in the way in which you go cutting people out of your life. Um, so I think you need to be uh, thoughtful in that process um, because you don't want to burn bridges. Um, at least in, in my in my world, I regret the bridges that have been burned um, immensely. So, um, but I don't I don't 
I can't think of a negative from adding quicker. Yeah. Well, I feel like there's, uh, there's a capacity to everybody. So, you know, if we get past step one, we have our standard. First thing I'm actually going to ask myself is, am I at my standard? You know, am I really at my standard? Because there's a lot of people out here, like you said, doing things intentionally. Well, if you're not doing everything intentionally, you may not be at your actual standard. When you step back and look at your life, you may see, well, I'm Dang, I'm, I'm horrible in this area of my life, and I'm really bad. I'm really bad in my relationship, and I'm really bad spiritually. I need to work on those. Like Tyler uses his core, his core four. Like he literally has where we'll tell you put some goals in those areas to get you to where you want to be. That may just be getting to what should honestly be your standard before we even talk about raising your bar. You need to get make sure you're at your bar. You know, if if your standard, if the I was in the military, there is a standard for physical fitness. And the test isn't the best test in the world, but it's push-up, sit-ups, and two-mile run. There is a minimum. It is the APFT standard. If you can't meet the standard, yeah. you got extra PT, you got extra work. We got to get you to standard before we can talk about, because you have to get the standard before you, you have to get the, you have to get to five before you can get to six. Mm -hmm. You have to get to six before you can get to seven. So we're going to get to the standard first. Uh, second part about raising, um, one good thing with, I feel like when you add people who, who want more out of life, which is what, you're, what we're saying is raising our, our personal life standard, is one topic that we all talk about a lot is accountability. So bringing other people into your circle who have done this, who have leveled up, who have moved up, who have pushed their bar higher, they're gonna start to hold you accountable for things because that's the quality. That is a quality trait. When you start asking me, hey, what about that, that business venture you said you were gonna do? You know, where, you know, I've, sure. Where's your progress? <laughs> yeah. well, you know, and there's no, and, that, and you may come back to me, I'm not going to do it, but I'm actually going to ask you why. I want to know yeah. why you're not going to do those things. So I think the, the people, bringing in people um, will help, definitely. Uh, I, do, I, I do think you can add people too fast because of capacity. Uh, I can go to this great event and meet all these people that are echelons above reality, and I get connections with them. They like me. They think I'm cool. They like my hat. Yeah. You know, whatever. <laughs> so I got now. I have, I love that. yeah. I have <laughs> Uncle Steve. If you're watching, man, come on. <laughs> got to produce. Down. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we gotta. We gotta. Uh, so you know. So now I have all these relationships. But then when a one day one Ted calls me and I'm like, yeah, man, I'm. I can't talk. I'm going over to uh, to to Tyler's place with those guys, and I, I gotta go. So you started to cut off people because you only have 20, you do only have 24 hours in a day. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you say. You might not be able to appease everyone. So there's a balance because I don't want to lose a one day, one day. I want to keep him. So you need to watch as you bring in. Is that what you actually call him? A one day, one Ted? Yeah. No, it's like, <laughs> it's like there's different hey, one versions. day, Ted. I feel like I get a, nick, nick, a new nickname every episode. <laughs> different versions. There's different versions, you know? <laughs> you know, you're going to get some versions here soon. Uh-oh, you better work out. Yeah, right, right. um, but yeah, I, I do think it's, it needs to be gradual, but different types of soil settle differently. So I may bring in three people and all of a sudden four people just disappear that I that I really needed to disappear. It may happen like that, and that's perfect. So now I can go out and keep, keep searching, keep looking, keep building more relationships. But I may bring in these three awesome people, but now it's, you know, because those people are going to need things. They do. And maybe they just need that conversation. Maybe they need your time. Maybe they, you know, they will need something from you. Yeah. And you need something from them. You need their time. But that time, that time is that resource, but now I have to take that time from somewhere else. I'm pretty sure none of us have, I would love to tell you, I got five free hours a day, buddy. I can expand, I can have more conversations, but I don't, I, I don't think I have one, you know? And if I do, it's, I mean, you got, I got my time to shower, time in the bathroom, but even if it's with my girlfriend, with my kids, uh, with my grandmother, with my brother and my nephew at church, working out, personal training, financial, I, I don't have it. So when I add, something has to go, and these are people. So when you start cutting people, I think naturally some people will go away just by the order of change. But to overdo it and just give every, a lot of people the boot, exactly what kind of happened. Because honestly, if you look back, it sucks that it happened. But if you still had all of those people and all the new things you're doing, something's going to suffer. It has to because of minutes, of, of seconds. So I do think a gradual addition and a and expanding of your circle is the way to go. 
because it will bring that accountability and that desire to want a better standard for yourself. So if we're surrounding ourselves with, with new people that are living on another level, um, I guess I'll pose the question in terms of whose standard do you live by? You know, we're all professional chameleons at one point in our life, you know, and we're, we're really good at borrowing color and taking color from the world and then calling it our own. When the world is waiting for us to put color back into it, you know, 99.9% .9 of us is exactly the same in every human being, but 0.1% of us is unmistakably you. You know, it's like your fingerprint and mine, and none of us are the same. Never will be until you and never after you. But deeper than that is the essence of who you are, the intrinsic stuff, your real value. That's unmistakably you. That's that 0.1%. That's why I tell people we're all a bunch of others, all the things we get caught up in. So who should you become? I think it's okay sometimes to borrow, but not pickpock, not pickpocket or breaking and entering, taking it. I'm taking this. It's okay to borrow someone's influence for a little bit as you're learning and you're a student. And I think that's a really good thing. But I want to add to that is awareness is of, is of the utmost importance. You, I think one of the ways that you can help not only discover your bar, but also raise your bar, is learning to develop your own self-awareness, which is your, your, your self-awareness, obviously, which is actually your personal competence side, your self-awareness and your self-management. Then you have the social side, social awareness, right, and relationship management. Just in those four little areas, we can understand, like I like to use this weight analogy. Remember when you were a kid, you didn't know if you could lift the bar on the bench? You know, you get a little nervous. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? And then you see all these other people. What do you do? You want to borrow their strength if you can. Then you start doing comparison, all these things that you do. So that's where it gets a little tricky. But if you were to say to one of them, I'm a little scared, man. I don't know if I can. I got, I got by the bar, but you jokers are throwing 45s up on the sides, right? I don't know. Can I do... Can I do 245s? Can I do four? I mean, you know what I mean? Like, what can I do? We have to make some vulnerability there. Be aware of how you're showing up. It's okay to get some chameleon cloak a little bit from them so that they can put a little there. But eventually, you've got to start putting yours out. And I believe that will naturally help you raise that standard. So I think it's a, it's a mix to begin with. Take on some of that. Get mentored. Get developed. But eventually, you got to step away. You know. And I know some of you are people of faith. You know, I think you all are. But um, that's why I say you need a, a Barnabas in your life, you need a Paul in your life, and you need a Timothy. You need a Barnabas who's not impressed with you, you need a Paul that can mentor you, and you need a Timothy to pour into. And I think when you're doing that, you're going to find the exchange of all of those in all of it. Wow. So how do you go about becoming more self-aware? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the million dollar question. Can we, let's turn that on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, That's emotional. <laughs> yeah. While we're at it, that cancer thing, I've been really wanting to get rid of that. <laughs> yeah, we're working on that too. Right? <laughs> uh, I feel like I'll, I'll take a, a, a swat at the unhittable. Um, <laughs> there's an emotional maturity that comes to different people. I mean, I've talked to people younger than me, and I've been like yeah. amazed. And I've talked to people that are. 60 years old and I'm like man you just don't get it whatever it is you yeah. do not get it <laughs> uh so but that also comes with you know emotional maturity as me understands it's a weight room's a great example so my my magic number is 275 as long as i can bench 275 and it doesn't hurt like <laughs> as long as i you know because I, I try to limit you know we've had a lot of talks about training and you know if you guys were you know bench press is not a, a functional exercise it's not but it's a uh, exercise. Yeah. 275. If I can put it back, good. Don't care about anything over that. Don't care at all. My kids are now in that high school age and they're like, bitch press. And I'm like, well, just watch your shoulders, but have at it. But that's emotional maturity. Can I do more than 75, 275? Probably, but I don't care. That's my standard. <laughs> and then within that area of life, in that area, I'm good. Yeah. I don't want to make changes there. Now, one thing I made a lot of changes in my church life recently like I was gone but I wasn't doing anything I was just there you know I, I go I listen and I'm out sit for the week I'm good now I started participating started bringing friends started you know getting on board started being a part of what was going on so for me that's that's raised I raised my standard there and and I need more but I was very but the whole point is that I was aware 
but that's by analyzing my own standard. That 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 is a very that could be a very key role for someone in becoming more self-aware. Look at your own standard and tell yourself honestly, is that making you happy right now? What you've established as your standard. And at some point, hopefully you'll say no. But there are people who are just permanently complacent. They, those people exist. And I, now another, a whole other thought process is, are they actually in a better position in life than we are? Because they're, <laughs> they're happy. Yeah. They're, they are happy yeah. and, and they're laying in the grass with their kid and they're happy. So, so. To, to that point with perception being reality, if they're happy and we talk about, I, I pose the question for self-awareness because everybody's going to, like you can't tell a mother that her child's ugly because it's her child. And, but we, we feel the same way about our businesses. We feel the same way about our artwork. If I record a song and I play it for you, that's the hottest song ever. But you might tell me, no, Ted, that's a terrible song. But I recorded it. And I could honestly look at it and think it's the best thing in the world. But my self-awareness is lacking in the actual quality of what I created. So that's why I guess I posed that question kind of leading to in, in terms of who do, you, who do we listen to? Because I'll ask for feedback on my work, but I'm careful with who I listen to with that feedback. I'm careful with, okay, one person might just praise me up and everything I touch and do is the greatest, but there could be rooms for improvement. And if my standard's higher than someone else's or not as high as somebody else's, how can I pick and choose who I listen to? I think you just threw three things. And if I don't say them, I got to get them out because if I don't say them, I'll forget them. <laughs> <laughs> you just threw together self-awareness, value, and purpose all in one thing. Like in one question, which is very awkward. So you can love your song, that's fine. You can be, you know, if you're self-aware or not, you can love your song, but what's the purpose of the song? Is it for your entertainment? Then it's awesome, it doesn't matter what anybody says. Are you trying to take it to a recording studio and make a, rep a record? And the 10 people you talk to tell you it's horrible? So now the purpose, the purpose of the song determines if it has any value. So if you're trying to take it to a recording studio and make money with it, it's not gonna work because no one likes it, so it doesn't have any value. So those three things, they play into each other in determining. Um, so I think the purpose, what is the purpose of the song? You know, what is the purpose? So free time is probably, or free time, I wouldn't say free time, time we spend, we spend with a loved one. What is the purpose of that time? You know, if you do have a free hour just for Ted, what is the purpose of that free hour? That, is, that literally will determine what you should do. The purpose will determine, will, will, will help you give it value. You know, will help you decide, yeah, that, that, that was a good free hour. You know what, I have been tired and there's a show I love and I haven't seen it in months. I'm gonna watch two episodes, I got two hours, I'm gonna watch three episodes and I'm gonna stretch and relax and let my body recover because I'm tired. But if you have, so that, that's a great two hours, right? Not if you have, like I know you have your online shop, so uh, appreciate the plug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but if you have sixty orders to fill, and you didn't take those two hours and fill some of those orders, did you, you know what's the value? So just don't don't let the the purpose determine the purpose before you start placing a value on something. I think it's all about accountability, and and so it's having accountability in each of those areas having people that hold you accountable in each of those areas, seeking out people to hold you accountable in each of those areas. Um, because unless you have someone or something holding you accountable, I have just found that I cannot hold myself accountable to certain things. You're your worst accountability. Yeah, the worst. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was just me. I'm glad you guys are the same. No, I agree. So, but so you need that. Like for me, like I, I needed accountability in my faith. And so I sought out one of the godliest people I knew, which was Jonathan Parker, who we had on uh, a previous episode. And I was like, man, I need accountability in my area of faith. You know, would you mind doing a devotion with me and keeping me accountable on that stuff? And he does all the time. Um, and then in all areas of my business. And, and it's just, you know, I hired a trainer this year because I hated waking up in the morning going to the gym. And I knew the only way I was going to do it is having someone there going, where the heck is Tyler at? He's supposed to be here. Uh, and so I think, you know, looking at that as those, that circle of influence that we begin to surround ourselves with, those new people that we bring in, I, if we look at a desired future standard as a goal, which I guess that's probably the definition of a goal, then who are the people that we can bring into our lives that represent our goal in that area? 
So for me, like faith, it was Jonathan Parker was that for me for faith. Um, who's the person in my business that I desire to raise my standard to? Okay, it's Joe Schmo. Well, I need to figure out a way to meet Joe Schmo. Joe Schmo may be a dude with 8 million followers on Instagram that lives in California. But I can start following and try to start conversations in the comments on his posts and try to invite him to be on a podcast. And then next thing you know, you're sitting down with Joe and he's like, a, might as well be a friend. And you are able to somehow get some accountability set up through that, whether it's accountability and just constantly seeing the way that they're living their life and being able to compare yourself in those areas to that, or whether it's them actually like calling you out in a text saying like, hey, did you pray today? You know, something very, very, very literal. Uh, but I think that's what that circle of influence is for. It's having, you know, these groups of people where, man, I want to be just like this guy in that area. I want to be just like her in that area. I want to be just like him in this area. And knowing that that's, that's like, that's the role that they play in my life. And all together, that makes this incredible group of people that all kind of represent this higher standard that I want, uh, that I want to be at. Um, that's, that's it. That's it for me. It's just accountability. And I like what he was saying is it's that influence because, you know, everything that we do, we're an influence. Whether we think we're not, you know, we are. Everything you do, I don't care if it's good or bad, you're, you're an influence. Um, and that accountability is, is so important that we need to be, be a lot more mindful and a lot more discriminant. Um, you know, we talked about even, you know, adding people too quick. Could it be a detriment in some cases? I think so, the capacity part. You know, Tyler... You know his experiences in a little and, different. And I'll touch on the, when you said that. It just made me. It gave me this realization that that's why I messed up because I forcefully put people out because I was taking too many on. Yeah, and and and, and that's. But see, that's that's what that's standards, right? It's going to affect us and have impact. And um, I, I call them necessary endings, mm. and I think they need to be done with care. And this is tying directly into your question, you know, and looking for that, you know, bringing it to somebody. Um, you know, anywhere I go, whenever I speak, I work with some great organizations. I coach people one-to-one. -one. Um, and the thing that I, there's three questions I have. Do they know that I care? Do they know that I add value? And can they trust me? And that's it. And when I leave, that's what I'm thinking about. Did they, did they experience my care? Did they experience me adding value to their life? And do they know that, can they trust me now with what I said? Was it true? Was it authentic? Was it integrous? Was it congruent, you know? And that's important. So when I'm gonna bring something to someone, like, you know, even talking right now, like to me, it's like, it's not mine, but even putting the things out here, I trust this enough, right? I, I know from this connection, right? Now I'm meeting the two, I'm hearing you. These things are, they gravitate, you know, what's on the inside, they, con they connect, right? Because you can only attract what you are. I mean, that's the way it is. And you can only reproduce what you are, <laughs> all right? So I'm feeling this. And so for me, I feel like care, add value, trust, right? So I, I wouldn't mind throwing an idea out here to this group. And I think that's a little, and once again, it's a standard again. When do you introduce it to someone? Ask yourself those three questions. Can I, you know, how do I know they care about me? Can they add value and can I trust them? But you got to be equal to that as well. Do I care about them? Can I add value to them? And can they trust me? So. There's a great point about, well, you just kind of, without saying the word, group, groups have standards. Like, yeah. when you surround, so when Tyler was saying, you bring those people in, you become a group, well, groups have standards. Mm -hmm. You know, like even the guys that I, I mentor, I'm like, now, and then the more I expect of myself, the more I expect out of you. You know, so <laughs> there, it's 100%. It's like uh, when you get a professional, professional certification. That, that, that organization has a standard. Now you have to do this, this, and this every year. You didn't have to do it before, but yeah. that wasn't your standard before. Like if you want to be a CPA or you want to be a CFP, you know, a sort of, you have to have, it's a credential to keep it, to meet that standard down, there's additional, additional requirements because groups do have standards. So it totally rolls into, like you're saying, changing that group, making, and if you don't have it, you don't create it. Create it, bring four or five people together. You know, I mean, I think we've all met people through, and as our first time meeting, first time meeting you, but we've all brought people to one another, yeah. you know, that, that have become kind of a little, a, a different type of group that, you know, you can reach out to and, you know, throw ideas off of and, and talk about things. So that's I awesome. That's the, 
perfect segue into the, the next portion here because we're talking about raising our thermostat, raising the groups and the people we surround ourselves with in order to increase our standards. And at some point, as we increase our standards, there's going to be people around us that don't meet our standards. Yeah. How can we, I guess, gently hold others to our standards? Because not everybody can simply be dismissed and left behind if we're talking about a spouse, a sibling, family member, a childhood friend that might not be up to your standards. How do you mm. softly impose that on others? Um, don't. You don't. Do you, you not hold others to a certain standard? I don't hold people to my standards. I hold them to their standards. Mm -hmm. I would never hold you to my standards. My standards, okay, what if my standards 275? My standards 275, Ted. <laughs> so do I, I'm not going to drop you if, just because you say your standards 225. That's not it. Now, if I feel like your standard is, is, is beneath you or, or you could do better, I'm going to tell you that to your face. I'm going to tell you because I'm your friend and I want you to, to have the maximum out of life. If you're like, no, that's not what I want, that's fine. That's okay. I'm going to hold to your standard. The only time I feel like it becomes an issue and I need to sever that relationship is, is your standard pulling me down. But I'm never going to hold you to my standard. I'm always going to hold you to yours until the point where your standards start to slow me down. Then, because one of my standards is to keep it going. That's, that's something for me. I, I, got, I got to move. I got to keep growing, keep growing. If I feel like you're hurting me, then it's time you know, to maybe sever that relationship. And it's not, hey, Ted, I'm not talking to you anymore. Tyler, we're not friends anymore. I got to go. It's just to slow down on the phone calls, slow down on this. And, and those relationships will slowly disintegrate. Um, and it's a much, you know, or, or reduce themselves greatly. Like instead of seeing somebody, talking to somebody three or four times a week, you end up talking to them once a month. Um, but yeah, you got to hold people to their standards. We can't set someone else's standards for them. Because my standard, if I was setting your standard for you, it's for you to live a full life and be happy. But if we all wrote that down, if we all went in corners and wrote that down and came back and put our paper down, we each got to write 10, 10 bullets. I'd be willing to bet none of us would even have the same bullet out of 40. Like not even one. 10 bullets of, of what our standards are. So I would just challenge it, you know, make sure you, once I, I tell you my standard, hold me to it. Hold me in, hey buddy, you said this is what you want to do and you're not doing it. What's up? How can I help you do it? So that's my, that's my initial take when you say that, holding somebody to, to my standard. You, you know, if, if you were in Charlotte and you were in Atlanta, and I was in Tennessee and you were down in Savannah. And we all said, let's meet at this building. And you pull up Waze app. Waze is going to give you three, four options each to get to the same location that we're going to. It's almost like the way our maps are in our own heads. The only difference is we don't get all those options in real time. And there's not a bunch of satellites helping us. Yeah. And so it is important, though when we understand another person's journey. See, that's the whole way a GPS works is you say where you want to be, and then it tells you, it looks at where you are, and it helps you get there. But see, what we're doing is we're, we're in different locations in our worlds and our own mental maps, even subconscious maps that we have already, that have happened to us. We're living in a current world, and we keep importing the past to try to make a future. And it gets too heavy. And what we need to do is talk to each other on that journey using the Waze app as we're going to the same place. Because me coming from Tennessee, you saying, Tim, why are you dragging? Well, I'm coming through the mountains. But ain't he, I don't have a problem coming up, right? You're, you two are hitting, you know, 85, coming, he, you know, he's hitting up from the beach feeling good, right, from Savannah, right? I'm coming through the mountains and hoping there's not a landslide, right? Because I'm going to get all you guys to buy me a new car. <laughs> but that's what happens when we're trying to project our journey on other people. Instead of getting a better understanding that my Waze app and yours Waze app is different. And we're coming from a different place. Function's the same, but we're getting different data. Become curious about that person's journey. Learn to talk on that trip. Learn to talk coming from different directions. Because our goal is still to be in that destination. And I can't help but to beat this thing but it's back to values. I can get a Jew, a Hebrew, like a you know, Jew. I can get a Muslim. I can get a Hindi, an atheist, and an agnostic to sit down. And if we want to talk about beliefs and opinions, we're going to battle all the time. But if we can find out what we value, 
and what the standards are that they're going to put into it, we can do a lot of things together. That's how we can work. And anybody in, in, in Washington, that's the problem. You talk too much about your belief in your opinions mm -hmm. instead of what we value so we can move this country forward. It's true. And I think as a group of people here, we all have a desire to serve and whether it's with a formal coaching relationship or whether it's mentoring, which I know you have a huge passion for. I think we have to be careful for that desire to serve others that are, that are living to a lower standard, allowing that to pull us. Yeah. And I think the focus is, you know, we've got that one person that, that we can all think of, that relationship that we, we're always having to pull them out from whatever they are, Coaxing. get them back on track. And you know, in three months later, you're going to have to pull them back out of that hole again. Uh, I think it's so important for us to, on the other side of that, have people that are pulling us. Because unless we have more people pulling us than being pulled, then just like you're uphill, downhill, can't go uphill in a downhill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, we can't, you cannot move forward if you got more people pulling you back than forward. And, uh, and I think that that's, that's extremely important. And I think the way uh, Charles was explaining it is how you do it because you develop this understanding of what their standard is. Yeah. And you almost like, it's almost like you're in, in a way dissecting yourself from the scenario because you're saying this is their standard this is mine i'm gonna view them as a completely separate it's like a completely separate side of you that's that's keeping that person accountable and having those conversations where it doesn't pull you down because uh increase is increase progress is progress and you can have someone at a substantially lower st standard by seeing them progress is still going to inspire you to progress yeah. Right. And it doesn't matter where that is. Like, like I would be fired up to see someone bench 135 that's never benched over 100 pounds before. And it's going to fire me up to do whatever that incremental progression is from my life. Uh, so I think that's important just to keep things in perspective, uh, but to always make sure that you are adding people, whether it's virtually or in real life, that are pulling you forward, sources that are pulling you forward. So what does it look like when you start to chase your standard? What, what is kind of some of the rewards you enjoy in life when you, when you recognize your values? I'd love to get your insight on you know, how someone goes about recognizing their values and then start living towards those values and those standards. What are some of the rewards and the benefits from doing that? You know, for me, people ask me, you know, why are people so important to me? Because you know, I grew up in so much dysfunction and so much brokenness, um, just trouble. Um, you know, I tell people I'm a, I'm, I'm a, to me, I view myself as Hamilton. You know, the song opens up, how does a bastard orphan son of a whore, you know? And, uh, but that's my, I love my mom, you know? And, uh, but that's what I found out was I fell in love with people through the fact that I wanted to grow. And so I fell in love with personal growth. And then I started thinking of the stories of people because I had one too. Not just the narrative I was telling myself, but the one that I wanted. So then I could put a demand on something. So if I have a desire for it, I have something that there has to be pressure. What good is a burden without any weight, right? You know, if I want the cream out of the little, if I'm gonna make a cake, say we're gonna do some little, you know, they do them cooking shows, and you see them kids making crazy things, you know, like, mm -hmm. I'm like, that kid's got some talent, he needs to go to school, <laughs> you know, or something. <laughs> but if you don't squeeze, you don't, get, you don't get that stuff out of that piping, you know what I mean, how they, it takes pressure, right? If, you, if we wanna grow something without pressure, a seed won't break and release the essence. So it, what's the story that applies to pressure? Because pressure is the privilege that we're all looking for. That's, what, that's the privilege to me, is the pressure we all share. It's, the, it's facing peer pressure. It's facing your story and the narrative and facing the pressure of saying, what narrative do I want to write? I got, I got blank pages. Hopefully there's more ahead of me than there are behind me. You know, and that notebook will listen really good to me if I start writing, right? So for me, the, the benefit is, is doing back to introspection and really getting to the lowest, discovering what the lowest thing is. What makes me happy? What makes me smile? Now, happiness to me is okay, but I'm a joy guy. Joy remains. To me, happiness is like little cobblestones that you put together some grout, you lay them all out to someone's house, but when you grout them, that's when you can walk in. It's foundational. It's the collective of all the happiness that makes joy. 
bound together. And so it's finding those pieces of little things like that that help you determine and find those values to me and, re- and then set standards to say, I'm keeping them. I will go no lower than this. And I may have to have a necessary ending, but that may not mean that I won't fellowship or talk with you, but it means that I'm going to be further away from you, right? Because I can't function that way. But the byproduct is man in peace between the still, stillness where silence is the sound. When I lay my head on my pillow, man, I have peace. And it's not in a flattened space, man. It's sacred. It feels cathedral like this room. There's space in there. I don't feel crushed by things. And that's, to me, the value of doing that. Hope. Uh, Yeah. I don't know what that means, but. (laughs) That's approval right there. (laughs) Wait, do I need to cry? I'm not not ready for that seat. I'm I'm moving too quick. I'm moving too quick. Uh, well, man, that was excellent. That was awesome. Uh, awesome explanation. Awesome thought processes. Um, we talk about rewards. I mean, I have my method. You know, I, like I, I say it over and over. I'm a system guy. I mean, my major in college was systems engineering, and I actually liked it, weirdly enough, because it's systems. It's yeah. this to this to this, and that's what I like to give people. I mean, when I spoke at GBL Hustle, one of my things is I'm gonna literally give you something to actually do. Yeah. Like you, I want you to walk out of here tomorrow, and you can do this. I'm not a pie in the sky person. That's just never been me, you know, because the same thing you say about uh, happiness and joy. I say it about motivation. Favorite dude, one of my favorite dudes here talk is E.T. E.T. is awesome. But if you listen to E.T. at 7 o'clock in the morning when you get up, where's that E.T. speech at 12? <laughs> Man, you were born for this. You were going to do it. You were going to crush it. <laughs> Man. You get to your desk, you see a stack of paperwork, it's 9 o'clock, E.T. is over. Yeah, it is over. <laughs> you, you were back to this dude. Bruh. Yeah. So, you know, I, finding ways to maintain. So I tell people, um, now for instance, okay, if someone comes to me as on the financial side, they're like, man, I'm in debt, I need help. I said, okay, here's what's going to happen. You're not going to get straight out of debt. You're not going to just chop it. You're not going to, I can give you a, a budget and I can say, okay, based on your budget, you'll be out of debt in 18 months. You're not going to be out of debt in 18 months. Guarantee you. Because yeah. your car's going to break down. This is going to happen. 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 Not going to happen. So let's say this. Okay, that's your first credit card. When you get that paid off, tell me some things you want to do. I'm going to take my family on vacation. What's that going to cost you? It's going to cost this much. When you get that paid off, go on vacation. Go. Do it. All right? Then the next one, when you get here, what's something else you want? Well, I've been wanting a new custom suit, it's going to cost me like 700 bucks. Now, when you pay that second card off, get your suit. Buy it. And they, they start to question, it's like, but it's going to take me two years to get out of it. It's going to take you two years anyway. Yeah. And you're going to be miserable. So the point of this thing that we're doing right now is not to be miserable. It is not to run face first into a brick wall the whole time. We're not put on this planet. We're not here to just work and work and work and work and work. It's not while we're here. There needs to be. So if you can't figure it out, I love peace. Like, but that doesn't work for a lot of people. Me and my girlfriend literally, literally have peace arguments. See, baby, I mentioned you two episodes in a row. I'm doing good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> check. Peace yeah. Argument. yeah. I literally have, we have peace arguments. Like when, when I get home, like some days, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we've all had the day. You get home, you don't really, you don't want to talk. And it's not because you're in bad mood, but you are just beat down. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you were hustling. You might have had eight meetings, conference calls all day. I've been peopling all day. But I just can't do it. And then you got to go to your significant other and you got to people some more with them. Yeah. I mean, I get on that couch. I'm just like, I, I, I just want peace. Now, I've done everything that I needed to do. I handled my business at work. And I just want that peace. I want that space. Put on a movie. Yep, sit your feet on my lap. But let's just, this is in. That doesn't work for everybody. They need rewards. They need those small things. I've never been a reward guy because as soon as I get, because I'm, I'm constantly, I want to push that bar. But as soon as I get somewhere, that's my thing. I'm like, okay, I, I made that standard. Let's, let's get a new one. So I'm looking for the next one or I'm looking how I can expand upon the one before. But if you don't, plan it. Put it down. Reward yourself. It is okay. It is not. People try to make that nowadays. Like I think they, they listen to these narratives from all these guys that are on social media. And it is hustle, hustle, hustle. But they're not telling you to kill yourself hustling. They're not telling you to hustle yourself de- to death. They're not telling you not to enjoy your family. They're not telling you to miss your kid's birthday because of a meeting. No. What they're telling you is when you are at work, work. If you have to work a little extra, do that. 
but there's more to life than just that. So program, if you can't do it, just like Tyler was saying with uh, the text messages when we were talking in the last episode with the text messages, how he had to put it in to make sure he texts his wife or put his face on to make sure he did it. Put that stuff in there, man. It's important. It is important. You know how much, if I go on an extended vacation, you know how much, and I'm like, oh, I'm tired, I just need vacation, need vacation. I'm itching to get back to work by that. If I do a five-day vacation, oh, man, I'm almost shaking by the end of because I like, I, I like what I do. I'm, I'm ready to get back to it. But I've enjoyed. I've refreshed. You know, I'm, I'm ready mentally. I'm ready physically to go back, to get back in there. You know, but I feel like people miss out on that. It's the one thing I used to talk, it's a little bit different what you do. I literally have, a, I have two other blocks on my, but one of them's fun. And I call it fun, but I mean, like, what, you know, program that in. Like, you know, uh, some people would consider that part of your relationship blocks with your wife, but like, you know, literally it's like, get out of Greenville once a quarter, like, get out of here, go somewhere. That's one thing that's on my list for my 90 days It's like me and lady, we got to go somewhere. And either me and lady, me and the kids, me, the lady and the kids, whatever. But you got programming, man, it's, it's okay. It, it's okay. And it's, it's necessary. And the purpose of all that work is fulfillment. So program your fulfillment in. Yeah, I think, again, if we look at these standards as goals, I think it's important to have short and long term. And that the entire, for me, the entire purpose of life is to, con- is to constantly be going after higher levels of standard, going after goals. But if we only have these super, super long term goals, then we can one day die without ever hitting them. And I think that will rob us of, of joy and happiness that we should have had on this earth. And so I think we have to have certain standards that are attainable, certain goals that we can reach and then we can celebrate, celebrate those victories along the way, because that's what brings me happiness is when I, when I do you know, hit a goal and whether there's an, a reward there or not, it doesn't really matter. It's the, it's the accomplishment of like, man, I wanted to get there, I got there. And as most men, we say, where, where to next? Um, but that's the whole process. And so when we look at this idea of a thermostat, and again, as a standard, and how do we raise this? Another area where I've seen work in my life to raise my standard, to raise my thermostat, is to jam-pack a ton of activity into a short period of time. For me, 90 days is, is typically what that looks like. So for 90 days, just doing as much activity towards these goals as you've ever done before. It's kind of like, uh, you know, on a pool, you got the water line. Yeah. You flood a bunch of water in a pool, it's going to raise that water line. When the water goes back down, that water line's still there showing you where you got to. And to me, that's what that crazy activity, because you can't, it's not sustainable long term. Yeah. You can't sustain at this level. Like, I'm talking about a level that you physically cannot sustain for more than 90 days. But going at it for 90 days, raising that watermark, raising that standard, raising what you thought may even was possible, then when your activity level goes back down to normal, you've still got that water line there that you remember what that looks like, you remember what that feels like, you remember what that tastes like. And then next time you do this insane amount of effort, it gets you above that. Now you've passed that water line that seemed crazy at first. Now you may even be able to reach that water line with your normal activity flow. And then now it's time for another just spurt of, of massive action in a short period of time. And by doing that over the course of your life, and it's not every 90 days, but you know, once or twice a year doing just an insane amount of work in a short period of time will take your game and your standards to another level. Uh, and if you're simultaneously doing that while surrounding yourself by other people that are holding you in account- uh, accountable for all these things, it's... Um, it's a powerful way to live your life, but I think unless you are celebrating those victories along the way, then you're going to be missing that fulfillment that we all ultimately want. Because there's no point in getting 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down, down the road having achieved this success or this standard that we wanted, but not being happy. I mean, that's, that To me, I'd, I'd rather be lazy if I'm going to be unhappy either way. Um, so... Why go through all this massive effort? Why go through all this struggle? Because there's going to be struggles on the way, on the way to meeting meeting any standard. Why go through all that if you're not going to be happy at the end of it? And and I think 
the way to do that is by having standards in all the areas of your life. If you've got a standard for your mind and your relationships and your body, then when you reach the business standard, you can look around and say, oh man, this is awesome because I'm in the best shape of my life also. And I'm in a great place spiritually also. And my wife and I are great also. <laughs> but if one of those things get out of check, then it'll always be, oh, this is great, but there's this big gap here. Mm -hmm. and, and so to me, it's going all in in all areas and surrounding yourself with other people that are doing the same thing, again, proportionate to wherever they are in their life. So a quick question before we wrap up here in terms of standards as they're being met. Do you think it's important to continue to raise those standards? Do you think complacency with the standards could, could kill the growth? I think or, you have to. Mm -hmm. I th and that's the uphill, downhill, <laughs> I can't remember, it was awesome. <laughs> but I think if you do not raise your standards, you will fall below your own. Just, and the more I've been learning about this, like your brain will create obstacles. It will create problems for you to have to solve to be able to stay the same. So if you don't have a standard that you're chasing, you're inevitably gonna, you can't just say, okay, I, I've made it. I've got here, I've gotten here, this is just where I wanna stay at. And, and I'm good. Your body will, your, your biologically, you will create problems and struggles to be able to stay there that would take the same amount of effort to stay there than it would to get to the next standard. Yeah, and I, and I think it would be really good to let people know that perfection is not a standard. Because that's what people are trying to do. They're trying to find this perfect walk, perfect talk, perfect life. It's not going to happen. Perfectionism, all you're going to do is you're going to find, you're going to beat yourself up. You know, it's, it's kind of like a, you know, in sports, I remember when, because I was a freestyle wrestler, and I remember, you know, my coach would be like, listen, I'm not trying to get you to practice until you get it right. I'm trying to get you to where you can, you won't get it wrong. And he goes, but you're going to get it wrong because at times, because you're dealing with another person. You're going to, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a lucha sport, you know, it's, it's person on person. It's combat, right? So when we get too baked into perfection and try to put that as standard, I think we need to release ourselves out of that and get more into the word of excellence. You know, and I think if you really want expansion, you need to be excellent. A lot of people try to expand and grow and they, what they'll do is they will relinquish the responsibility of being excellent. And so determining what excellence is for yourself, you know, because growth can only be sustained by structure, which I know you like steps and practical things. You know, this building would not be here without the proper structure. So as they add on to the building based on where beams are and everything else, you can add to it. So it is going to be a regular process. We're going to enhance some of our standards. They're going to improve. They're going to go up a little bit. Some of them may just stay. I mean, it's, it's high enough, right? And not high enough, meaning it's good enough because we know good's the enemy of great. It means it's solid. It's bedrock. It does not need to move, but we can always get it challenged because something happens and right? Because we can't control, we cannot control this world. We can't control situations. We can't control people. The only thing we're in control of is ourself, our mind. Hopefully we're working on it. And what's going on inside of us other than that? That's all we got. So just make sure, I just want to say, don't let perfection be a standard. Yeah. You, 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 it, it's elusive and you'll never win. And every time you reach it, you're going to find out you missed it. Mm -hmm. Every time. Well, guys, if you've made it to the end, some of the closing points here is first and foremost, audit your current position and find out what your base standard is. Secondly, surround yourself with those who are living at a higher thermostat level. I love the analogy with the thermostat in terms of what level you're living your life at. Increase that level, surround yourself with folks who live at a higher standard so you can then again raise yours and continue to raise your standards as they are met. Don't become complacent with where you are. So continue to grow. And our main worry, it sounds like, isn't that you're going to set your standards too low and meet them. It's that you're never going to chase the higher standard. So set the high standard, reward yourself along the way. And I want to close with a quote my dad told me, which really kind of changed the course of my life. He said to me, he said, son, set your standard and demand it. Mm -hmm. And don't accept anything below that from other people. Since I've done that, I've grown a lot personally, and I've seen the people around me grow. I've seen my circle grow as well. So if you're listening, set your standard and demand it. And go out there and be a modern man.